Hi everyone, my name is Andre. I'm working as a senior data engineer at NVIDIA. And here with us, Jacek Laskowski, I believe you know him, at least if you uh, used Spark at least for a few times, you should know him for being a great Spark expert and an author of his uh, Spark internals online book, which is used for by lots of data engineers uh, during uh, trying to understand how Spark works under the hood. Hi, Jacek. Hey, hey I'm there. How are you doing? Doing very well. How are you? No, oh, couldn't be better. A little bit stressed because, you know, that's how I feel before my talk. So I yeah, can't wait uh, uh, when I start, uh, you know, doing this presentation. So I'm over it and I'm done. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, do do you do you have uh, some discovery for us, Zoch? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, quite a few. As a matter of fact, uh, every day brings uh, a new discovery. And you know, I, I wish it didn't happen before my talks, uh, before because you know it leaves me in this unconscious state, uh, thinking about uh, you know all these discoveries rather than uh, my talk. So just uh, yesterday, I discovered that uh, Apache Spark 3.0 uh, got released, got blessed, and it's about to be released very soon. It's not uh, you know, a matter of uh, weeks or months, but just uh, you know, a couple of days. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are some changes which I'm uh, going to touch upon uh, during my presentation. Not that, that many, uh, because we are, about, uh, we are about to talk about internals, which didn't change as far as this uh, and my talk is concerned. So yeah, so this is one of the discoveries uh, uh, of the uh, recent days, and yeah, more uh, in my presentation. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, I have some uh, details for the audience. First of all, thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a Telegram chat for uh, questions. Please feel free to join it. And after our talk is ended, is finished, you all are invited to a, a discussion area which will happen in Zoom. I believe you all have uh, the links as well. So I guess we can we can start if you are ready, Jacek. I am. Can't wait, as I said. <laughs> so, stage is mine. Yep, yep, I can see uh, the presentation. Okay, Go ahead. Oh. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for, for this introduction. Uh, thank you for making uh, uh, myself uh, even more stressed by all this intro and uh, prizes. Thank you so much. I'm trying to deliver uh, the latest and greatest of Spark and some other, you know, interest of mine uh, to the public, purely uh, for fun and for free too. So today um, I'm going to talk about Apache Spark as an in-memory only data processing engine. And this question mark at the end of my um, presentation title or talk title um, sa says it all, meaning I've got no idea whether it is really possible to make Apache Spark uh, um, really in memory only, but I'm gonna give you some hints. So if you wanna make Spark in memory only data processing engine, they may be of some help, okay? So the idea of this presentation is to share what I've already uh, uh, found out um, regarding this topic, uh, you know, in memory only data processing engine, and yeah, pose some questions. Uh, perhaps you may have uh, also asked this question uh, yourself before. Uh, so together we might uh, find uh, better uh, answers and, and perhaps uh, find th uh, this impossible or uh, kind of challenging. So uh, again, uh, given that I'm spending, uh, I've been spending my time with uh, Spark for the past, uh, every day, for the past uh, five plus years as an independent consultant, uh, I am not going to say I've got uh, all the answers to your questions about Spark, but uh, quite a few I think I can answer. So feel free to 
ask any question uh, about Apache Spark you may have. Uh, leave this in chat somewhere in, uh, on this platform. And uh, I apologize for not answering all the questions uh, and also uh, um, not focusing on, on things that you may find relevant uh, because you know I only see myself uh, and uh, the, the slides. So sorry. Uh, this interaction is, is uh, fairly limited, uh, not only because of this uh, COVID situation, but also because we are online, okay? So, yeah, my name is Jacek Laskowski, and let's get to the bottom of this talk. So, a little bit, uh, uh, a little intro to uh, uh, me, myself, uh, uh, that, that should shed some light on how much I know about Apache Spark and the the, the subject. So I'm Jacek Laskowski, and I'm IT freelancer specializing in Apache Spark first with uh, um, Delta Lake and Apache Kafka. Um, as a matter of fact, I just finished a two-day uh, Kafka workshop uh, uh, this week, and so I had to switch immediately uh, to uh, Spark thinking uh, after you know two heavy days with Kafka and Kafka Streams. And I've got some uh, brief forays into a wider data engineering space, so so to speak, or uh, to call it like this, um, with Trino a little bit, uh, uh, formerly known as uh, Presto, and KSQLDB. Um, I've been thinking about why I'm interested in these tools, and I think it's because uh, they are uh, more for data engineers, uh, SQL savvy, rather than programmers, software engineers, and I think uh, the, the easiest uh, um, um, uh, for platforms is just to deliver something that uh, most people know, and SQL is, is uh, de facto a lingua franca, as they say, uh, for data processing. So yeah, that, that, that perhaps uh, would explain why Trino and KSQLDB caught my attention lately. Uh, contact me at Jacek at Yapila.pl. This is my uh, official uh, email address. So drop me an email with any questions you may have about this presentation, as well as uh, um, any previous ones, and any topic uh, related to uh, Spark, Kafka, Delta Lake. Or you can just DM me on Twitter. Um, you can find me at Jacek Laskowski and just yeah, let me know what you, what you are after these days. Uh, I'm best known by the internals of online books uh, that are available free of charge uh, online at this address. I'm going to show um, some of the books uh, soon, uh, but uh, when I close this uh, slide, so uh, no one can claim that I spent too much time on about the speaker slides uh, during my presentation. So let's move on. So friendly reminder, uh, if you've got any questions, uh, Leave them in, in this uh, chat uh, um, window somewhere uh, on the platform, and I'm going to answer uh, them, uh, not all, but a uh, few at the end of the talk. OK, thank you. OK, so um, when I was asked um, for, for the slides for this presentation, uh, my first reaction was, no, no slides. I'm going to show people the code. Uh, not really um, going uh, full steam ahead with uh, live coding session, but kind of uh, similar to live uh, coding, live sharing. Okay, and but then I realized, uh, and that's what happened uh, during my meetups too, that uh, I can drift away into uncharted areas and find myself uh, more confused and perhaps confusing uh, you too. So yeah, I just created this slide, the only slide to be honest, um, that I'm going to use during my presentation, which basically is just a bunch of links to uh, materials I think may be relevant to the, uh, to the subject, to the topic, uh, to the talk. And yeah, because basically uh, I am going to uh, improve my uh, online books uh, so you don't uh, need any slides, any talks just uh, go straight into internals of, for example, Apache Spark and, and have all the information you may ever need and, and, and to Spark, <laughs> no pun intended, uh, your interest into uh, knowing even more. Okay, so let me start with this uh, breaking news. Uh, this is uh, the discovery I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this talk. Uh, uh, yeah, Apache Spark 3.2.0 got finally released. 
And I put this almost in, in um, brackets because, well, it's not officially released yet, uh, but the uh, branch is there, the tag is there. So I'm gonna now click this, hopefully it won't mess my uh, presentation too much. And I'm gonna, yeah, this is just to show you that uh, this tag uh, V320 uh, is already available. And so you can build your own uh, 320 uh, Spark release um, uh, from the stack and, and have what's gonna be available um, as uh, 3.2, okay? It was marked as available seven days ago, perhaps because, you know, that was created out of this tag that was available seven days ago. So that, that's not necessarily true about this tag. It's just to uh, mark some point in time. Anyway, so it's not yet uh, known that it's available, but it is, okay? So I went ahead and built my own Spark 320. So all the, all the, uh, um, all this presentation is about what's going on under the hood of Spark two, uh, Spark three two zero, three two three dot two dot zero. Okay, uh, so th uh, three two. So uh, yeah, so if you find something that you haven't uh, found in your uh, Spark release, it may be because I'm using the latest and greatest. Okay, so okay, going back to my. Uh, presentation again. So, and now, oh, whoops. So, um, yeah, so we, now we know that Apache Spark uh, 320 uh, got released and uh, the official release is coming. And while I, after I noticed uh, this uh, release, I immediately fought this uh, urge to update my internals of Apache Spark, especially that I knew I'm gonna refresh my memory my, my knowledge about you know um, what I'm gonna say uh, during this talk uh, anyway. So I updated the internals of Apache Spark right after this release, and look at look what I did. Oh come on, that's not what I wanted to do. Sorry. So I did this. So um, yeah, as you can see, this is uh, um, just updated, and I focused on well exactly what you could imagine local directories for block storage. This is just very fresh uh, update. Uh, and all what I'm sharing right now is publicly available. This is a public repo on my um, uh, Yapila-books uh, um, repository. Uh, so uh, you can find uh, this book and some others. So if you go uh, you know, to this uh, repository, you can find Apache Spark internals, uh, Kafka Streams internals, Kafka internals, uh, brand new. Um, had to refresh my memory before my uh, today uh, Kafka workshop and some others like Delta Lake, uh, PySpark, uh, Apache Beam too, but not that fresh as the others and some others. And this is good opportunity to switch to yet another kind of slide or address and show you all the internals online books I am offering to the market to you, free of charge. Uh, you have the only price uh, you have to uh, pay, so to say, is just your time. So there is this book about Apache Spark. There is another about Spark uh, SQL, Spark Success Streaming, and others. Okay. And the reason I'm doing it is just exactly what I'm doing during this presentation. Well, I'm sharing what I know hoping that if, you've, uh, if you find this or that uh, uh, not uh, precise enough, uh, you start asking questions. Basically, you drive my curiosity and my knowledge even um, to the point where I know more than uh, you know, my souls uh, do, and I can help you um, perhaps commercially too. So that's the... The, the gist, okay? So, um, oops, again. So, uh, yeah, I updated. So let's go to um, this talk. So it's a quarter past uh, uh, the starting hour. So, oh, oh come on. So uh, let me open it. And so the talk is about uh, whether Spark can ever, or is, or could be an in-memory only data processing engine. So the answer, 
as you may have guessed already, is no. So if, and I had clients who asked me, can we start Apache Spark in memory only? Uh, meaning there's no disk uh, or there's uh, uh, such a small disk that uh, we can't even consider it a disk. Uh, just to boot up uh, operating system and that's it, and then perhaps Spark 2. So uh, I didn't know it, uh, so I spent some time and uh, and also asked this question on Twitter and got uh, an answer from some people who said, uh, we tried it, we tried to change uh, the code. It seemed to have been working fine, yet we haven't tested all uh, possible uh, execution paths. In other words, it is possible to make a Spark in memory only data processing engine, but it's not by default, okay? And just to prove it, I'm gonna show you what and, uh, what and how Spark accesses uh, uh, local hard drives, okay? Uh, so even though uh, uh, many people would consider Apache Spark uh, in memory only data processing engine, it's not in uh, most uh, heavy cases, heavy workloads, where we are doing uh, some aggregation, um, basically introducing uh, shuffles, or using something that's called uh, uh, broadcast variables. And by using these names, yes, I assume some knowledge um, how to work, how to use uh, Apache Spark, so I'm not gonna go in depth into uh, what uh, broadcast variables or uh, uh, shuffle uh, um, R, but just, just assume that uh, some knowledge is in your heads already. And uh, so, yeah, so there are some uh, uh, things that uh, Spark needs disk for. And among them is just what I mentioned, broadcast variables, a very nice, uh, cool feature, especially for uh, something that's called broadcast joins in Spark SQL, or you could just use it uh, um, for your own uh, purpose. Uh, or, uh, yeah, for shuffles, that's something inevitable uh, in a sense where uh, you, you need uh, some kind of aggregation or repartitioning, then you've got no choice but reshuffle your data, basically introducing a shuffle of some kind, local, uh, narrow or white. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Shuffle is shuffle. Uh, it just uh, it touches your disk and Basically, that's it. And um, even though, yeah, Spark uh, wants to be in memory only, uh, it, it, it keeps uh, um, um, as such uh, for, um, for uh, long enough. Um, there are simply um, um, uh, uh, um, cases where, yeah, uh, basically, it's, uh, um, this is the moment where Spark accesses the disk. So, yeah, so let me show you when exactly. Okay, and this is this is this demo. Okay, uh, hold on. Yeah, so uh, uh, this is the demo. So I close this, and I was also told uh, not to switch uh, between slides and 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 and, and tabs in my uh, window uh, too uh, uh, um, too often, as well as too fast. So, so I'm, I'm slowing down a little bit. Okay, so. This is the demo. This is the demo I'm going to use for this presentation. That's the driving force, so to say. So to yeah, so to uh, say. And that just gonna show you uh, how Spark uses disk and for what. Okay, just just give you some understanding of the topic. So let me zoom it in a little bit. So and and please don't read all this. Uh, that's something I'm gonna say anyway. Uh, as well as uh, it's available publicly, so we can just uh, reference it later after the stock. So, yeah, so there's this component called Disk Block Manager. I haven't introduced this yet. I'm going to uh, do this in a moment. And there's this notion of block data. And blocks are pieces of data. So these are the, the data. The, these are the the, the yeah, these are the um, data-related pieces that Spark manages to uh, keep us happy as uh, uh, data engineers. And it all boils down to this Spark local dir uh, configuration property. So this property, and I'm 
showing you another tab. So I'm switching now. So don't get confused if you see me switching. Yep. This Spark Local Deer is a configuration property that points at list of directories, local directories that are available for something um, some people uh, uh, call scratch space. It's a temporary storage for map output files in, in, in shuffle stages. RDDs, when they get cached, for example. Uh, so eventually, there are some cases which beg for uh, um, a temporary storage. And that's exactly what this Spark local deer configuration property is for. So, and as it is about disk, and, and we are thinking about uh, large data set uh, processing, we want to have these uh, directories on a very fast local disk in our um, system. Uh, meaning, we are we used to uh, um, uh, consider SSDs as uh, fast enough. So, uh, if you can uh, have uh, faster disks than SSDs, fine. It's even better because, as you know now, uh, Spark will use this local deal, uh, and yeah, the the fast the the fastest the faster the disk, the better. So by default, it's a Java I/O TMP deal system property, which is just a random uh, temporary location. So um, now you know that to keep everything in one place, to keep it under your control, just use this Spark local deal configuration property, and you should be fine. Okay, and that's exactly that's the 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 gist of the demo. Just to um, use this uh, Spark local deal and control the directory, just one, one, one is fine, but it could be uh, multiple uh, local disks, uh, local directories. And by doing this minus minus con while I'm starting this Spark shell, I am simply launching a Spark application, interactive Spark application that uses this local disk directory um, for further exploration, okay? so. What I'm gonna do now is to switch to my terminal. So yet another window I'm gonna switch to and just start the Spark shell. So hop, and yeah, I tried it before. So I'm gonna close this and I'm gonna okay, re uh, remove the directory that I may have already created, which is the one that I'm about to create for this presentation, for the purpose of this presentation. So I'm going to start this Spark shell. This is just Spark application. And uh, with this minus minus con uh, spark.local.dir uh, configuration property, OK? So bam. So this Spark 3.2 is, uh, is uh, going up. And after a few secs, yeah, um, we will see this uh, nice intro to Spark version 3.2. So I am using uh, Scala to 12 uh, on JVM uh, on, on JVM 11. Mm, this is the the uh, these are the latest versions supported by Spark. Some people reported Java 15 um, uh, um, worked fine. Uh, never heard any news about Java 17, which is the latest uh, released, uh, release of uh, JVM. But again, Java 11 uh, uh, works fine and is blessed by uh, this uh, community, by this project. So by doing this, um, I uh, asked uh, this local environment to uh, create uh, this Spark local deal. And I also enabled uh, um, you know, uh, um, um, uh, some debug uh, uh, statements from debug logging level for a component who is responsible for a Spark local deal. And as you can see uh, here, there is this warning that uh, this Spark local deal will be overridden by the value set by the cluster manager via Spark local deals, especially it happens in, ah, there is also another one, local deals in Yarn. So just by looking at this intro, you may learn uh, a little bit about what's going on 
uh, when you deploy your application um, on uh, cluster managers like Mesos, Standalone, or Kubernetes, as well as Yarn. So you see that uh, Spark uh, uh, needs this Spark local deal-like uh, directory or directories and uses it. Uh, um, yeah. So now you've got the, the 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 answer to the question that's the title of this presentation. It's gonna use disk um, unless you change Spark, the vanilla Spark that you are downloading from uh, Spark Apache Org. So, so what it is, what, what did uh, Spark create at startup? Uh, um, let's let's have a look. Okay, and that's basically uh, the demo. Uh, but I'm uh, yeah uh, showing it uh, just so uh, we've got something uh, uh, useful. Um, not only seeing uh, uh, my writing. So look at this, and you see, without even executing a single query in SQL using Spark SQL or um, using RDD API for something more sophisticated, more low level, so to say, uh, we see two directories already created. One is Spark, Another is block manager. And Spark is the other directory, subdirectory that's created in every local directory. Again, local, local uh, Spark local this uh, is a comma separated uh, uh, list of uh, local directories. So in every local directory, you will see block manager dash and random UUID created as well as the Spark dash and random UUID um, as well. So uh, you've got this uh, block manager and Spark directories. And what we are interested in uh, is this block manager directory. Okay. So uh, whenever you start your Spark application, you will have it uh, on the driver and executors. So yeah. So what is, what's under this local this block manager directory? Well, nothing uh, at, at this time, uh, at this moment. But uh, yeah, what's going to uh, be saved here is uh, part of this demo. So let's uh, continue. OK, so I'm switching back to my browser and showing you the next steps uh, of this demo. So we started our Spark application. OK, and yeah, as I wrote here, we are interested in block manager, although it's not the only uh, directory created at startup. And then we are now creating something that's uh, uh, called uh, data blocks in Apache Spark. So if we start persisting our data frames or RDDs, or using uh, broadcast variables, or doing uh, shuffles, then we are touching disk. Okay. So by default, uh, by default, uh, uh, cache slash persist operations, assume storage level to be memory and disk, and Spark, by default, tries to keep everything on in memory uh, until a memory runs, uh, um, runs out. Uh, at this stage, uh, uh, if uh, storage level allows for this, Spark will uh, uh, start uh, flash, uh, flashing or spilling, as they say it, spilling to disk. Uh, so, so just to make it more clear, uh, I uh, just simply uh, um, requested uh, the storage level um, um, uh, as the only uh, storage level available. So by doing this, I am forcing um, um, disk usage, um, whether there is memory or not. Okay, because well, that's the purpose of this demo. Okay. So uh, yeah, so you may see uh, files being created in this directory in block manager later in uh, the lifetime life cycle of your Spark application, but at some point uh, Spark will spill uh, uh, some blocks, uh, or maybe not spill, but save some blocks in this block manager. So I'm gonna copy this code, switch to terminal again, and simply execute these two lines. So yeah. So as you can see, just by looking at this, I imported storage level just to make my uh, next line a little bit shorter and uh, simpler to read. But that's basically a very select star from 
uh, table of two rows uh, query that I am that that I marked to be persist at this disk only storage level. So if I'm using this data set, this is very small data set, but it could be you know billions of rows. Uh, I am uh, simply saying, hey Spark, please keep this data handy so I don't have to travel back and forth between data source uh, um, and still have access to uh, blocks of data, basically data uh, that, 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 that sits uh, um, behind this Spark range too or any other um, SQL slash RDD query or operation, okay? So this, what this, what this does, this persist or cache, is basically say, is to say, hey, executors, and um, via this component called block manager, please keep blocks locally. So when I need it, and when I say I, I mean uh, um, uh, this query that you are uh, executing, uh, when, I, when your query needs it, well, it's uh, uh, available locally rather than remotely in data source, which may be very, very expensive. So now you are trading uh, via this persist, whether you are, you are spending time uh, um, sending bytes over and over again over the wire uh, from data source to uh, your um, uh, Spark uh, um, engine, or uh, whether you need more disk because, uh, well, um, this all what was uh, uh, um, uh, fetched from data source now is available locally. So basically, you can think of replicating your data locally. So that's why you shouldn't be really uh, uh, fetching data and then immediately persisting it if you know that uh, uh, your disk uh, disks uh, are not enough to store all the data. Rather, just pre pre-filter this data and then just save it. Uh, so um, it's, it, it's shorter and cleaner or smaller and, and cl cleaner, okay? So, uh, and then I, I, I'm, I'm doing this count, uh, something that, that's an idiom in, in Scala API slash Java API uh, for Spark SQL, uh, because, you know, persist is lazy operation. So I wanted to trigger this persist. So I do uh, persist uh, um, when, uh, when I execute this, uh, this line, this query, okay? So I am counting for the only uh, reason, for the only purpose of uh, uh, having this persist executed. And as you can see, uh, I've got this insert adaptive Spark plan, something that's uh, um, brand new in Spark 3, uh, adaptive query execution. Well, it was available before, but uh, it got uh, turned on, enabled by default in Spark 3 now. So it's something that uh, you will have to deal with, uh, whether you like it or not. You can always disable it, but uh, yeah, that's, but basically, uh, you shouldn't. Um, and uh, so I've got this uh, debug uh, statement. But uh, what I wanted to focus on is this debug for disk store. Okay. As you can see, just by executing this Spark range to persist, very basic query over two row table data set, you are seeing uh, attempting to put block with these cryptic names. Uh, 16 times, oh, so, yeah, 16 times, because I've, I've got uh, 16 CPUs uh, on my uh, Mac OS, on my uh, laptop. So uh, yeah, this, this is uh, what we are seeing now. And, and then basically, yeah, uh, the disk store replies, okay, we attempted to put this block uh, uh, locally. Uh, basically put means uh, store. And then we got this, yeah, stored as a four byte, uh, byte file on disk in 70 milliseconds, uh, 17 milliseconds, and, and so on, okay? So now, having seen these this, uh, debug state uh, uh, messages, you can just have a look here and see that this tree is now much more busy, so to say, or, or uh, more complex. There are all these files, with some files inside. And this is just to hold this 
local uh, just to keep this uh, the, uh, the, the 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 blocks for 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 the query we persist uh, um, locally. So there are quite a few uh, directories with some files inside. Okay, there is this index, there is uh, some checksums, uh, some data, and yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you, you've already guessed uh, uh, what this, uh, these files stand for. Um, data is the data uh, itself, and checksum is just to check, uh, uh, how is it called? Uh, uh, um, the, 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 the other files, the data files are okay. So valid, validity, um, uh, of this uh, of the other files uh, here data, and that's and there is some index. Uh, can't remember what it was uh, used for, but uh, uh, yeah, sounds like uh, some kind of indexing. But uh, Spark does not do uh, uh, indices, uh, does not use indices, uh, but, but, but uh, some uh, index like uh, um, data structure. So we've got these uh, files here. Okay, now the question is. Why did we get uh, 52 directories and 64 files? Um, why do we need all these files? And, and what's, what's the pur purpose? So let me switch back to my uh, slide, to the demo. And then, yeah, just, just summarize a bit uh, uh, what we've learned so far. So um, we've just observed uh, uh, what blocks, what files um, were created. And uh, during this seemingly very simple uh, query, so start from two row table. And we did this from common line. So now you know that by using this Spark local deer um, configuration property, uh, you control the, the local directory. And basically uh, for our demo, it's very handy because we can control uh, um, location of this uh, directory. And we just uh, took a peek at this uh, um, at this directory. Now you can talk to this disk block manager directly, the the the, the component of Apache Spark, as Apache Spark platform uh, that's responsible for uh, any interaction with uh, disk, and just say, "Hey, disk manager, please, disk block manager, give me all the files that are available." So let me, and this is just very brand new. I didn't know it. Um, and only because of this presentation, my talk, um, when I got to know this, uh, um, this little gem, so to say. Okay, so uh, that's the, 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 um, one of the main reasons uh, why I'm always enjoying giving presentations uh, like this. I can learn even more and share this to the public. So we are more effective in using tools I enjoy working with and perhaps you might find them enjoyable uh, too. So let me copy this and switch to terminal, doing this slowly, and just execute these two lines to see all the files that we've seen by doing this tree. So we can go at common line level, or we can just use Spark environment, this component of uh, uh, any Apache Spark application, and just simply ask for block manager who owns, this is the component who owns um, for any interactions with uh, disk and in-memory uh, uh, data, and just say, hey, this block manager, give me all the files that uh, you are managing. And that's why we've got this, uh, you know, pass to uh, block manager uh, um, stored files, okay? And we could just simply uh, uh, not count but size, and we've got 64. So that's basically what we got here. So yeah, at this time, uh, at this moment, I wish I could ask this question. Do you have any questions? But yeah, um, as you as you know, it's not that easy. So I'll I'll continue. Okay, uh, I'm switching back to my slides and to, to the demo. And uh, this is very nice that I uh, have this demo because I would, I was uh, um, almost, I, 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 I would have forgotten uh, to show you how to look at all what we uh, looked at uh, from common line and from a Spark uh, shell perspective using good old uh, uh, web UI. So going to localhost 4040, 
switching uh, tab to this Spark uh, uh, UI tab. And when I click, you see that I executed count twice. Yeah, that just uh, because I executed these two lines um, twice. And now I, I try to zoom in and click storage. Yeah, you guess it right. Storage is the tab that's responsible for giving you hints about how you how your Spark application um, uses uh, um, storage. Uh, basically, either it's in memory or is is it already on disk? And look at this. We now know that uh, we've got uh, one RDD uh, already stored, 100% um, uh, cached, um, no in-memory uh, blocks. So we've got all uh, on disk. And this is the, the, the size uh, um, we needed for um, storing um, this query on our local disk. Okay, and cached partition 16. So uh, my storage level was disk serialized, serialized um, disk, um, disk only, and one replicated. I could have uh, this data replicated uh, across uh, available um, uh, uh, executors that would look similar to what happens in uh, Apache Kafka. So when I'm, when I'm switching between Spark and Apache Kafka, I sometimes ask this question, how far Spark is from Kafka uh, as far as this storage is concerned. And you'd be surprised how close they are um, delivering basically disk access. So yeah, that's, that, 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 that's it. And this RDD name is something that uh, um, data frame API uh, gives to our RDDs, but we can just go um, to RDD level and basically do the same uh, uh, persist um, and and with with this um, extra um, extra uh, feature that we can just add uh, uh, RDD name, so we can just uh, mark this specially in the storage UI. So let me switch back to command line slowly. Okay, and what I just said requires you to change this range, this SQL query, into RDD. Okay. So hold on, I'm gonna do this. So I keep it handy. I close it. Let's let's do live coding session. Okay, I've got access to this underlying RDD of longs because this is data frame of longs. Then I just simply repeat what I typed before. Okay, but the difference is that now I'm leaving data frame slash s spark SQL space and via RDD entering RDD API uh, um, uh, one. And yeah, I've got access to Persist too. So let me see if that's gonna work too. And um, the, the reason, ah, by the way, the reason I'm gonna do this, ah, I would almost forgot uh, the, the, the purpose of, the, of, going me, of me going uh, at RDD level. It's to give name set name to um, smart data to, to assign a name uh, uh, to this RDD so we can easily find it in web UI. Okie doke. So let's give it a shot. Hop. You see, we again uh, stored uh, all the blocks, even though we did it previously, this query is brand new. So Spark could not match uh, uh, you know, these queries as same, it could, but it didn't. It could, uh, I, I said it could because uh, technically it, it's possible, but it's not implemented in vanilla Spark, okay? So uh, yeah, I just uh, did the same query uh, using uh, different APIs. So I left uh, RDD, uh, the SQL space and entered RDD. And that's why I triggered this uh, uh, next uh, um, uh, data safe, data, local data safe. Okay, so let me switch to web UI, not to confuse you, doing it slowly, and refreshing this tab storage, hoping to see smart data under RDD name. So three, two, one, voila. <laughs> okay, I'm glad because you know doing this live demo sessions uh, 
not all uh, works uh, works sometimes. Um, sometimes you know it it it, it can break. Uh, so yeah, so uh, I was a little bit uh, uneasy with this, but yeah, it worked fine. So as you can see, um, but now something that I I found quite interesting another discovery. So. Uh, I was asked, uh, uh, you know, what was uh, the recent discoveries of mine? And just today, when I was preparing for this demo, for this presentation, I found that the size of the uh, on disk of this uh, Spark SQL query compared to RDD uh, um, one, the sizes are different. And I can't explain it. Well, I've got some faults, but... Uh, uh, if I started sharing my thoughts, I'm probably I'd probably uh, confuse you even more. So I'm not gonna do this. But again, this is just something that I found today, just before this presentation. Okay, so I'm leaving this uh, in this environment. So I'm closing this tab slowly, and that's basically it. So yeah, just because we enabled uh, logging, uh, I did this before presentation via uh, you know this um, specifying all logging levels for disk store and disk block manager, we were able to see all this uh, debug uh, 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 printouts and or logs. And yeah, we could um, feel more um, uh, confident and, and happy uh, knowing uh, what's going on under the hood. And that's it about this demo. If you've got any questions, please leave them uh, in this uh, chat window on the platform. Okay, so I we did this demo, and basically we are uh, about to uh, finish up. And so I'm slowly going through the other links, which basically are talking about something we've done already. So uh, this block manager, I've been telling you that uh, this uh, um, this is the component of Apache Spark that's responsible for mapping these logical blocks on, onto the physical on-disk locations, okay? And this disk block manager is integral component of block manager. So we've got something that's called block manager and going to another, another slide slash tab, block manager is basically a, a manager of our blocks and it runs on every a, a runtime environment of our Spark application slash applications, meaning whether it's driver or it's uh, executor, there is block manager. Basically, you can consider block manager synonym to uh, executor because, well, executor launches and the driver uh, 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 launch um, Spark environment together with uh, uh, um, um, uh, appropriate contexts, and they spin up or, or create, instantiate a, a block manager per JVM, okay? So this block manager, when created, uh, uh, creates uh, other components like memory store and disk store, and manages something that's called unify uh, uh, memory space, so to say, uh, part of uh, something that you may have heard of uh, as uh, uh, unified memory uh, management and via these two components, memory store and disk store, the the, the, the focus of this presentation, uh, it manages uh, um, data in memory or on disk. Okay, and this disk store is just a nice uh, a nicer API um, to disk block manager. So this disk block manager again, we are back to disk block manager, is uh, one component of many that this disk block manager uses for the uh, uh, block manager uses for its operations and the disk block manager uh, by default uh, there is this one block mapped to one file on uh, on disk and by, uh, denoted by something that's called block id and this block id is very nice to know because this data structure of spark i'm switching to another tab is basically um, contract for data block identifiers. And by knowing all these uh, implementations identifiers and knowing that it's a sealed abstract class in Scala, you know that there is no other implementations um, available in Apache Spark except those 
uh, that I listed uh, um, all you can find in official uh, Spark uh, document, uh, uh, Spark source code. So there is broadcast block ID for broadcast variables. There is RDD block for RDD partitions if they are cached. There are shuffle block uh, uh, batch IDs. Um, I haven't discussed it probably because it's uh, uh, for something that's uh, of less interest. There is shuffle block for shuffle blocks. When you are doing uh, shuffles, you will see shuffle blocks. And they've got this nice identifiers. So when, I, when you look uh, under the hood uh, into this uh, local directories, you will see they identifiers just like shuffle or RDD, something we saw when we looked at uh, our local directory or broadcast. So yeah, there are these implementations, broadcast, RDD, blog, shuffle blog, and others. So there are quite a few, as you can see. So these, these are the blocks that Spark may or may not store on disk, okay? So it keeps, uh, uh, it keeps data in memory as long as it can, but eventually when it's about to run out of memory, uh, rather than throwing out of memory error, uh, it simply uh, spills the disk or, or just saves uh, to keep uh, processing uh, uh, up and running. Okay, closing this block ID and going back to, to this block manager. And then you know that uh, uh, block files are hashed among uh, local directories. Uh, you may be asking this question, why there are uh, you know, so many directories and, and why? So first of all, uh, local directories are uh, controlled by this uh, local, wh where is this? Uh, it's, uh, hold on, it's uh, um, this, yeah, there is this, block manager local directories, there could be one or there could be more. And no, something that I found uh, today, if there is no local directories defined or accessible because of mm, uh, uh, wrong uh, paths, well, uh, your application won't start. And basically, you will see uh, exception, uh, I could not create uh, local directories and basically created, created local directory for successful creation or fail to create local deal. And uh, if you ignore uh, all directories defined, well, basically uh, um, a disk block manager will throw an exception that will get propagated up to, uh, um, to the top and then uh, your application will fail. Okay, so I close it. And we are running slowly out of time, so and I'm glad that we are uh, at the bottom of, of my, <laughs> uh, you know, agenda items. So I'm, I'm glad this uh, was already covered, block ID. And there is there are, you know, this, this uh, configuration properties, oh, sorry, uh, configuration properties like Spark local deer, which we've covered already, which is comma separated list of directories, local directories, best, and they'd be on uh, SSDs. And there is another Spark property you may consider uh, uh, interesting, which is Spark disk store subdirectories, which basically is the number of directories uh, uh, you want to have per local directory, or one local directory. And default is 64, if I'm not mistaken. Just check the documentation, or better, uh, my uh, internals of Apache Spark notes online book, and, and you will know it. Um, what's the default value and how, where um, this and other um, configuration properties are used. And the last but not least, um, there is this Spark files uh, 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 utility that you may have used in the past uh, for something like accessing a local uh, hard drive for some files that you wanted to pass uh, uh, from the driver to executors. And this, this Spark files utility is um, something that uh, you can use in your um, data pipelines to access files that were transferred from um, uh, the driver to your executors. And that's, again, another directory um, that Spark uses and creates in this local directory on every executor. So this Spark files get root directory gives you uh, one root directory among all the uh, uh, local directories uh, that you can use for for files, for files that uh, are not a part of executors, even they, they, they Docker containers, but uh, will get transferred automatically by Spark. 
via, for example, minus minus packages um, command line option, or via minus minus jar jars uh, command line option, or the last but not least minus minus files uh, um, option. So as you can see, these three um, options, command line options of uh, Spark uh, submit uh, um, show that there is a need for some permanent storage uh, for files that you want to have transferred uh, between uh, from driver, the driver and executors. Okay. And that's basically it. And I think we, we are fine time wise. Well, that's interesting because, you know, I was worried that uh, I won't share that much and uh, not to say enough, but looks like that was okay. So, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that we are at this, uh, at this uh, slide because we are done basically. So, uh, what I wanted to highlight is that uh, this internals of Apache Spark, what I covered and what I could uh, have, but I didn't, is part of this internals of Apache Spark online book that's available free of charge under this uh, books.yapila.pl address. So you don't have to remember this Apache Spark internals uh, URL. Yeah, I know. I'm working on making it uh, more user-friendly, uh, better to understand, easier to understand. But I'm not very good at this URL C, uh, CEO uh, uh, things. Uh, so yeah, if you happen to know how to do it properly, DNS-wise and, and all this uh, crazy uh, DNS-related uh, stuff, not to bring uh, uh, this Facebook failure <laughs> to our uh, to our memory again. Um, yeah, let me know. Ping me and, and uh, let's talk. So yeah, this is free of charge, and this is being updated uh, uh, to match what's available in Apache Spark 3.2.0, the latest and greatest, to be released very, very soon. And yeah, quite, quite a few people found it uh, fairly useful. They started, so 1K of people found it uh, um, enough uh, to, to start it. And there are some others uh, who fork it on GitHub. So yeah, again, this is free of charge. And that's, that's all, folks. Thank you so much. You can't imagine how happy I am that I delivered this presentation on time and perfectly how I planned it. I think it's the first time I finished before being told I should have. <laughs> I should. So uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm happy and you should too. Uh, and yeah, enjoy. So you can find me on this URLs, on this uh, um, email address. So drop me an email if you if you find this uh, uh, yeah, collaboration interesting and you wanna dig deeper. Thank you. Thank you, Jacek. Thank you for this amazing talk. I think we are very excited about it. And we have a few questions. Uh, I think we do not have much time for all, all questions. Uh, I'll ask two. Uh, first of all, uh, is there a way to find which files are related to a specific data frame when you are using .cache or you are shuffling the data? So the answer is yes. It's not uh, mm, um, available, you know, out of the box, but there are pieces that you can stitch together and you get this. So for example, uh, when you are caching something that I presented during this presentation, this demo, uh, you notice that RDD underscore are the blocks that are for RDDs. So now you've got the first clue. Uh, then you notice that there was this number, uh, for example, nine or 16, and that was for RDD identifier, RDD identifier. Every RDD, whether it came from data frame or uh, having been created directly, got unique identifier. It starts from zero and just progresses. Uh, every, um, you know, uh, inc is incremented by one. So uh, now you know that this is RDD of this identifier. And by this identifier, you can get access via, for example, block manager to this RDD, access it, and then you can just uh, make make a match with a data frame, which is a higher level um, language atop RDD, you'd have to do extra hop uh, and see query plan of your data frame slash SQL query. 
And then by seeing your query plan and seeing what RDD IDs were assigned to your query, you can easily do this mapping. So I think you can easily uh, uh, stitch all this together and create a tool that would say, these blocks are for this RDDs. So if I need them on another platform, I could just simply transfer them and have this query executed even faster. Thank you, thank you. And the last question is, what happens if, the, if some worker fails what happens? What will happen with the files which are managed by that worker? Very good question, and that just this is perfect question for interviews about you know what you know about Apache Spark, because part of part of RDD uh, RDD name is resilient. So RDD stands for resilient uh, distributed data set, and this resiliency is key to understand what's going to happen with these blocks. Blocks are gone. But the data is not. The data is still uh, in the data source. So, well, now you know. It's a Spark will figure uh, blocks needed for computation are gone because of executor, that, that executor slash block manager is gone. So uh, it's going to request reprocessing of this blocks slash partition again, meaning there is going to be a repetition of uh, some tasks. And that's basically it. It's going to happen on uh, available executors. And yeah, it's going to take some more time. Uh, but eventually, Spark should uh, um, uh, be um, uh, OK. And uh, the only price is time. And uh, the reason why we use uh, Spark is exactly this resiliency slash fault tolerance. Spark can hide complexity of managing failures in this distributed environment of executors. So either the processing, the, the part of this processing is going to be repeated, or if we are using a, a shuffle manager, uh, um, uh, external shuffle manager, uh, we fetch this data from this uh, external shuffle manager service, and uh, yeah, we're done. So either we go for this data to a uh, data source itself directly, or we uh, fetch it from um, Local-ish, uh, um, still external, but closer to our computation engine, um, external shopper service. That's basically it. Okay, thank you for the answers. I believe all the data, all the information we, we got from your talk was extremely useful. And I'm sure that everyone uh, will be able to test that starting from tomorrow. And uh, Let's finish the, the talk. Thank you, Jacek. Thank you again for this amazing talk. Let's uh, switch to the discussion, which uh, is currently in Zoom. So feel free to join everyone. And let's continue to discuss uh, this exciting topic there. Uh, and thank you for the listening, basically. And I, I think that's it. Have everyone a good day. Evening, Jacek. Thank you again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for, for you know, driving this presentation and helping me staying calm and, and sane. So yeah, you helped me a lot. Uh, so so I'm, I'm really glad to have you here and, and be my host. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.